All right, all right. Well, you know, reading Ephesians, you know, realistically, it is one of my favorite books of the Bible, and we could probably sit up here and just read the whole book of Ephesians and call it a day. It is such an amazing passage of uh, uh, Scripture. Before I get into that, I want to just rehash our uh, vision here at The Rock. We're in a vision series called A View from the Rock, and I want to talk a little bit about just the big picture of that, seeing the full scope of what we're talking about. And every week when people come through the the lobby here at The Rock, they see identity, community, and mission. And our vision is threefold. Since we're in a political season, I'm going to use the term our overall platform here at the party of The Rock (laughs) is to to build identity, community, and mission. And what that means is there are three arenas of life that we ask all of our, everyone in our body to live in. And it is a biblical context too. It's not just a rock thing. God did this long before the rock ever showed up. But um, our first aspect is our relationship with God. In our relationship with God, we receive our identity in Christ as sons and daughters of God. And in that relationship, that is the, the upward expression of our faith. Then we have community. And Sean said earlier, in, in we get revelation, but we get transformation in community. I like that, something like that. A very concise, easy way to say it. Then we bring it into community, and there we have fellowship with people. And uh, then as, as a, a team or a family, a kingdom family, we live on mission together. And those are the three arenas of life that we are trying to construct here at The Rock. And as leadership at The Rock, we looked at what is the best context For our rock family, where individuals, couples, and families can grow and thrive. It doesn't matter what your demographic is. Godliness is profitable unto all things. And so this is the plan that we have and the structure that we have at the rock. My whole life, I've heard pastors say, and and I've been a Christian for over, I think, 48 years now. And... My whole life, I've heard pastors say, let the church be the church outside of these four walls. And that's great vision, and it's true, but very few times in my life have I seen a strategy in the church that could possibly have that come to be realized in, in the confines. And as a, as a result, and going to church conferences and everything, I would hear the frustrations of other pastors saying, why... Why can't, how can I get my church to be the church outside of the four walls? And they would preach about it. But there is a real structure here at the rock, a kingdom structure where identity, our relationship with God, we get the download, we live it in community and we go out on mission. And that's something that everybody can participate in. It doesn't matter how old you are in the Lord, how young you are in the Lord. God has called us all to live in those three arenas consistently to realize that vision. That is true biblical Christianity. The litmus test is can everyone participate? Yes. What if our faith was a spectator sport, not a contact sport, like Sean said? What if all we did was come in on Sunday morning and listen to a message and not really get to participate in the process? That boring, that would be boring, right? God has called us all to participate in this. It is important to realize That everyone can bring their God-given identity into community, be a blessing there and be blessed, and then step out and live on mission with their kingdom family. That's the process. All of this is about relationships. It's all about relationships. 
Whether you're looking up to God and your relationship with him, others in the body, or your relationships that you are missionally connected to, that you're trying to reach. It's all about relationship. If we are casual about our relationships, then we're casual about the kingdom. If we are intentional about our relationships, we are intentional about the kingdom. The kingdom of God is all about relationships. And these three arenas that we talk about are inexorably linked. If my up is weak, my identity and relationship with God, but I'm involved in community, community is going to be weak too. If my community is weak, then my relationship with God has nowhere to go. That revelation that I receive from God has nowhere to go and be processed and uh, uh, identified. And I can't be built up in what that identity is. It is important for us to have that fellowship. They're all linked together. Now, today... I'm going to be talking about the identity piece of these three arenas and how it relates to our relationship with God. And people really do want to have a sense of identity of the top eight things surveyed amongst people. The number one was that people want to have a life that matters. They want to have, they want to be able to look back on their life and my life made a difference. I did something with my life. It mattered. And a lot of that is connected to identity. It's interesting because it, uh, lately, over the last couple of decades since the internet came around, one of the things I've noticed about the reach for identity, and man has reached for that throughout history constantly. But what I've noticed recently with the invention of, of the internet is all of the genealogy uh, websites there are where you can go and, and look at your past, you know. And it is really a quest for identity. People want to know where they came from so that they can determine maybe in some way who they are or why they are the way they are. And uh, also there's TV shows that people watch about uh, movie stars who go back and, and look at their past to see what their genealogy is because people want to mean something. Now, in, in my life, several years ago, we had several family members decide to start diving into the genealogy thing. And usually it's people who are later on in life. I don't know why. I'm sure there's some younger people that do. But in my experience, it's been the older people. They start going down the home stretch and they're thinking, okay, I want to see what, you know, what my life is about, so to speak. So we had people jumping in on all aspects of uh, uh, our life genealogy, and we found out that we had a Viking ancestor who governed over the province of Israel for a period of time in history, and we found out the, uh, a bunch of weird stuff. We found, I don't, my wife's frowning at me. She's probably, Mark, you got that all wrong. It's okay, honey. <laughs> Something like that. And, and uh, then, then also we found that um, uh, uh, the first church established west of the Mississippi when settlers came over into the uh, uh, St. Louis, Missouri area um, that uh, our ancestors changed. Their, they were the first worship leaders west of the Mississippi. And they were called, they changed their names to Abraham and Sarah Music. And that was their names. And right now, to date, my, my, my mom and I recently did a brief count of our, our, our family right now that is alive now. And we have over 14 musically gifted worship leaders in our family. So, you know, there, there is some connection there. But it's, you know, the problem is, is old Bill Williams. <laughs> we were related to old Bill Williams. Have you ever driven through Williams, Arizona on the way to the Grand Canyon? The town's named after him. And, 
you know, and he was, he was really a cool guy. There's a big novel written about him. And he was the man, the, the pioneer who, for the government, went and charted the Arizona Territory. He explored it. He mapped it out. But he did it because he was a Christian and an evangelist. And he wanted to do that so that he could go and evangelize the Indians there. And so as, as we tell that story in the family, that's usually where we want to stop. <laughs> because what ended up happening was he married an Osage Indian squaw and through that process fell into pagan worship and fell away from God and died that way. So that's not a happy ending. But see, that's the problem with relying on genealogy for your identity. Because wherever there's a president or a a general or some person of notable character in your genealogy, there's also an axe murderer or a a serial killer. it, It really doesn't have any teeth. For every glorious display of humanity, there's a little eh, eh. And there too, you know? So we have to, we, we can't find our genealogy or who we are really based on who's in our ancestry. But this is what's beautiful. We can go several generations back or even several hundred years for, to find out our natural genealogy. Or we can listen to what Paul says. In Ephesians chapter 1, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Forget this two or three hundred years back. I was called out by God from before the foundation of the world. And that's my genealogy. He chose us in him. He predestined us to adoption As sons through Christ. God is our heavenly father. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sin. According to the riches of his grace. Which he lavished upon us. God doesn't hold anything back does he? He doesn't. He wants to unite us in him. In him we have obtained an inheritance the work this is what i love the work that he has done he is doing right now in you and will do tomorrow is to the praise of his glory that's powerful that god is working in us and somehow that work that he is doing in us and the transformation that is taking place in us in the spirit realm resonates To the praise of his glory. Man that's beautiful. And when we heard the word of truth. We believed in him. And we were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Which is the guarantee of our inheritance right now. We know the Holy Spirit is here. We sense the Holy Spirit is here. And that is evidence that. This is true, that we have an inheritance that we are receiving now and will receive at the end of time. That's what gives us a sense of belonging, is when we believe God's translation of who we are and we function in that identity. What makes identity important? Well, identity is the clarity to vision. So one time... We stopped off at a mall somewhere that we were unfamiliar with. It was a strange mall. And we needed to find a specific store and get something there. And so you go into the mall, and when you do that, you look for the marquee with the map and everything. And so we go in, and we're looking for the store that we need to find. And, okay, so we're going, oh, there it is. So And then it's over here on the second floor in this area here. And so... What I started to do was take off and go to that, but I was missing a key piece. You got to figure out where you are. If you don't know where you are, you you don't know how to get to where you're going. That's kind of like identity. If we don't know who we are fully in Christ 
and our identity in Christ, then how are we going to be able to get to where we need to go? If we don't know what gifts and talents and things that God has blessed us with and who we are and what organic resources we have to bear out of the treasure of our heart to get us where we're going. We need to know who we are and where we are. Back in the 80s, there was a really strong identity and destiny message that came out. I don't know if any of you remember that, but it was strong. All kinds of books were written on how to fulfill God's purpose for your life, how to uh, uh, fulfill your divine destiny. And several people were writing them, and, and they were powerful. They really ministered to a lot of people. They ministered to me at that time. And, and uh, they were significant. But they lacked some of the basics, to my memory. Maybe they were there in some, but they lacked some of the basics. So let's think about these basics for a minute. I am created in God's image. I am called to be like him and to grow up in him into all aspects. That's why the Bible says... As we behold him, we are transformed into his likeness. The stronger our relationship with God is, the more we become like him. And not only was I created in the image of God, I'm called to reproduce. Now, God told Adam in the garden, be fruitful and multiply. We were created in the image of God. Now, Jesus, the second Adam, came along, saved mankind, and told his apostles to be fruitful and multiply by going and making disciples of all nations. These are the foundational truths of our identity. We're created in the image of God. And we are called to reproduce that image in others, to share the gospel. That's significant. That is a piece fundamentally that I believe was lost, at least in the circles that I was in. Now, it's true. God can call us to be real estate agents, work in the marketplace, construction, the medical field, or finance. He can call us to do some of those things that, and, and does. People are called to the marketplace. I believe that. They're called. Into, I believe Michael Tiarina was called to be a nurse and to do what he does there. I'm not going to go into the details of that, Michael, because it's too much. We are called to do those things. But we are called first and foremost to make disciples. First and foremost. Being a nurse is something that Michael does as part of the process of making disciples. He's not a nurse first, and when he has time, he makes disciples. Do you understand the difference? We are called, our identity is that we are created in the image of God. We're called to be like him, and we're called to multiply that. That is the foundation. And when we don't have that foundation, we can go into a profession in our lives and have decades where we never make a disciple. It's important to have that foundation in our hearts. You might say, Mark, this is a mission message. It's not an identity message. No, this is an identity piece. If we don't get this into the depths of our hearts, we're going to go through our lives not living out of that aspect of our identity. But it is key and it is foundational. Well, why do we have to fight so hard for this? Why can this seem so difficult at times? Because we know that living in our identity isn't something that just accidentally happens. It's something that we have to fight for and be intentional about. Well... Think about it this way. Before Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the garden, 
The Bible says that they walk through the garden in fellowship with God in the cool of the day. And if identity flows through relationship, they had unfettered relationship with God and their identity was intact. Everywhere they went, they experienced the life of God. They experienced their identity, what they were created for, to love and minister to the Lord and to reproduce. It was a powerful thing. But when they ate of the fruit in the tree, uh, from the tree in the garden, it was the beginning process of the stripping away of the identity of mankind. And it went on from generation to generation. There, by the sin nature came in and started to leech their identity out of their being and everything that we were created to be. And almost everything we encounter in this world is identity draining. Now think about this for a minute. In the garden, before the fall, everywhere they went was the life of God. There was only one place they could go to have that taken away. Now, because this is a world ruled by Satan, the God of this world, the Bible calls him, Everything now in the world is identity draining that we come across with the exception of everything that is linked to Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. No one can experience their true identity except through the cross. Jesus is the only way. So it's completely reversed. And I will tell you, the God of this world will use any culture you live in to seize your identity and to fashion it into what it wants it to be, contrary to the word of God. Whether it's politics, capitalism, entertainment, sports, and leisure, every one of those aspects of our lives is fighting for identity. I'm not saying you can't participate in those things, but we do them out of a kingdom identity not trying to derive our identity because, uh, uh, from those things. But if we're doing that, then our ego, our identity starts to be how we perceive ourselves, our ego, it starts to be constructed by this world, not by the word of God. And so we start taking on the imprint of this world. And that's why Paul says in Ephesians, you formerly walked according to the prince of this world. In darkness, we don't have to walk in darkness that way. Our ego begins to be constructed by the things of this world. Now, this is an important statement. The state of our identity in Christ is one of the primary indicators we have as to the condition of our bond with him. If we are living and breathing in the revelation of who God has created us to be, and we are living in the strength of that, that is an indicator that our relationship with God is very strong. Now, let me explain it this way. My brother and I, Brother Doug, did several marriage conferences together. And something that I learned from him was about the sacred bond between a man and a woman in marriage. It's a sacred thing. Now, you know, Fred and Judy, thank you for showing up today and supporting. Uh, we have a small handful of people here this morning that are... Uh, have joined us here today. Uh, Fred and Judy, there's a bond between you two. But Fred, you can't control that all by yourself. It takes interaction with both of you. Judy, you can't control it all by yourself. It takes the interaction of both of you. It takes the participation of both. But when you're both consciously aware of this bond that in some ways feels like it exists almost as as a separate entity almost sometimes when I think about it because it's a combination of both of us, not just one or the other. 
that that bond is very important. And when that bond is strong, our marriage is strong. When that bond is strong, agreement is easier to come by. We fight less. We, we agree on where we're going easier because we're both connected with each other. When that bond is weak, we get frustrated or more impatient with each other. We're challenged by each other more. When the bond is strong, we respect each other's differences and not despise them. The bond is a sacred thing between a man and a woman. And likewise, the Bible talks about Christ being the head of the church and the church being the bride. And there is a bond between us and God. And to use a, a uh, economic term, we got a ch- term, we got to check out our bond rating. You know, we have to check out where it's at. Is my bond with my wife strong? Is my bond with God strong? Is his divine influence throwing through my heart and ministering my identity to me? And am I living out of that identity? And if my ego is corrupted with the things of this world, I won't be doing that. In the world, here's another way to look at it. In the world there are economic indicators. Housing starts, factory orders, the stock market. And they tell us what condition our economy is in. I'm into the economic terms today, Fred. So, uh, you know, And they tell us the condition of our economy, what it's going to be like potentially in the near future or where it's at right now. Well, when it comes to our identity... There are egonomic indicators, indicators of our ego, how we see ourselves that get in the way of our identity in Christ. And people will make identity statements and you can sometimes get a feel for where they're at because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A psychologist once told me that in sessions, they will listen to people speak and they will make identity statements that are contrary to the word of God. And when they do, he challenges them on it. I am anxious. I am an anxious person. Well, the Bible says be anxious for nothing. But they have received the identity that the world has given them and it's imprinted on their heart. So he walks them through the process of saying, no, you're not anxious. You don't have to give in to that. God hasn't given you a spirit of fear. That's another one. I'm a fearful person. I get afraid easy. I'm not a trusting person. I don't trust people. What are the economic indicators in our lives that are contrary to the word of God that can be an indication as to what kind of a relationship that we have with God and how we can be healed and restored to his identity for us? All of these indicators that I have shared are a sign that we are trying to do it on our own. Now, God called us out from before the foundation of the world. He chose us in Christ to be his sons and daughters in his image to reproduce in this earth. Now, it doesn't get any better than that. There's no improvements you can make on that trying to do it yourself. That's who we are. That's what we're called to be. And when we say no to that and we try to do it on our own, it is the exact opposite of being a child of our Heavenly Father. It is the orphan spirit kicking in. Somewhere in your subconscious, I might consciously know I'm a child of God, but am I living it in my life? Am I struggling to prove my identity as opposed to living in the identity that Christ has given me. 
at some point, you're going to have to sacrifice the lies that the world has given you for the truth that God is telling you right now. At some point, we have to let go of those lies that the enemy has told us and by faith curse them and say no to those and confess the truth over our lives of what the Bible says we are. And that was something that I learned a while ago. I mean, I, I was doing the math on it. And in Bible school, I, I went to a school that really focused on faith. And I probably sat under 500 hours of faith teaching. But it was always in the context of, and it was good. I mean, faith works by love. So it was a good, it was a good experience. I, ne- I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. But it was about how we can help others believe God for their healing, how we can help others to believe God and stand in faith for their finances or to have a victorious situation in a challenging circumstance, how to believe God in faith to change things. And it was powerful, but there was never that piece in there of how can I stand in faith For my transformation in Christ. How can I stand in faith? How can I take a lie that the world is telling me. Call it a lie. Tell it what it is. And stand in faith for the truth that God has for me. And then faith without corresponding actions is dead. One translation says have the corresponding actions in my life to walk out what the word says about me, regardless of how I might feel in that moment. That's what the truth says about me. That's what I'm going to believe. And that's how I'm going to live because that's what the Bible says I am. I believe we can use our God-given faith in our transformation process You have everything to lose and everything to gain. Now, Mark, what do you mean by that? I mean, everything that you have to lose is dying and decaying anyway. It's not worth having. It's a compilation of your life as an orphan, not as a son or daughter of God. You have everything to gain because everything in Christ is eternal and life-giving. The alternative is to remain in a constant, vicious struggle for your identity. And that is a bummer. We can corrupt obedience. Yes, there is a thing called corrupt obedience. Is when the things that we do for the Lord are a struggle for our identity and not as an act of love and worship to God. Does that make sense? That's corrupt obedience. That's saying that, God, I'm going to do it because what you did isn't good enough. Wow. When our identity is realized, just imagine this pulpit as identity. When our identity is realized, I realized I move from that vicious struggle to prove my self-worth and my worth to others. It gets washed in my identity in Christ and I come out. And the things that I do, my acts of obedience are acts of love and worship to God. God redeems my life. It's powerful. God redeems my life. Everything I do gets washed in my identity in Christ. And then from that point on, everything I do 
is an act of worship and love to God. All of my obedience before, it was about me. Now it's about Jesus. And what I love about serving in the community store or at the food pantry or in different outreaches that we have here at The Rock is with our identities washed in Christ, we're out there giving out clothes to people, food supplies. We are loving Jesus and worshiping him in the process. That is our act of worship, and there are many ways. But that's a powerful one. Listen to what C.S. Lewis says. Your real new self will not come as long as you're looking for it. It will come when you are looking for him. Does that sound strange? The principle runs through all of life from top to bottom. Give yourself up and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you'll save it. Submit to death, the death of your ambitions, your favorite wishes every day and death the death of your whole body and submit with every fiber of your being and you will find eternal life. You'll find your identity. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have given will ever be yours. Nothing in your life that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. So you might as well die to it. It has no future. Our fallen identity has no future. Our kingdom identity has eternity. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ and you will find him. And with him... Everything else will be thrown in. Amen? Christ has set this example for us. And I didn't realize how late it was. So I'm going to wrap this up. I should have been looking at the clock. Christ has set this example for us. He denied himself on the cross. And he laid down his fleshly self for our inheritance in eternity. The key to our kingdom identity is to die to ourselves, seek God as our heavenly father, and live in that position of strength. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for your word today. And the blessing that you are in our lives, Father, that we stand here as sons and daughters of you. Lord, and that we can live in that amazing identity as a way of life. Blessing you, God. Glorifying you. Reproducing your kingdom in other hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen.